just got this final lecture, I don't know if I'm going to be talking about this topic of the time that I'm going to be sharing. Okay, so I'm back to giving you an overview of three image programs that are in school in new practice. They are different than a typical image program. We are basically looking for students who are interested in design and entrepreneurship or public policy, looking for students who want to concentrate on solving some problems that may not have existed. in foster between entrepreneurs starting their own businesses. The program is evolving and this year we started focusing the program around some project and next year we are going to focus the entire program in all three uh, areas uh, around the project that we actually executed starting from September on. Probably the 12 months will be divided in Discover phase, which is from September to December, we are looking at an existing problem and trying to identify what are the possible ways to solve it. First, identify, making sure understand what the problem is and possible problems. The second phase is defining what is the possible solution. And the third phase is delivering either some sort of prototype solution or engineering study or something like that. The outcomes of these three programs are uh, maybe some prototypes for production or some startup companies in entrepreneurship, our public policy studies, or some engineering studies. The program last 12 months, as I mentioned before, is a project. And for people who are in entrepreneurship, the traditional six months where they are trying to start a company and move it to the innovation part. Uh, we offer several interdisciplinary courses in uh, innovation, creativity, uh, design thinking, sustainability. Uh, at this point, they are not common courses across all three programs, but if you're in one program, you can take courses in another program. Each program has mentors associated with it, and the role of a mentor is to ask open-ended questions, open the horizons, bring issues to rise and deep help you working with real life issues. The students that we are looking for are not necessarily straight A or A pluses. We are looking for people who besides being solid students are also interested in pursuing new solutions, have passion for innovation, have that intended to grow in the fruition and passion for starting a company and actually want to go through all the pains associated with that. Uh, other things that stand on the constant requirements in terms of GPA. In design, we have three different fields. One is infrastructure, the other one is sustainable community infrastructure, and the third one is production and process systems. Uh, for instance, the kind of project the students work on is solving children anxiety prior, during, and post. So let me jump to the next slide so you can see that I just got right on the corner. They work with my McMaster Hospital to identify what's the problem, how to solve it, and they came up with a methodology that enables children to know always one step ahead, what's next. And that removes the fear of the unknown. Then we have a preliminary trial and I'm also we have more traditional things if you are in drug course of design, for instance. We had a couple of students developing a model, hybrid model of distillation power, which has only about 100 equations, but has the same accuracy as the data frame model and also plus. Uh, then the bottom right, you can see a truck with a big collapsible tire. There's a company in Hamilton which uh, makes the stars and it used to take them five to seven days. Uh, a couple of years ago, we had a student working with them, and he changed the design of these things in the manufacturing process, and now they are down to one day. Uh, we had a student uh, work with a company in 
Ontario here to develop software for providing online advice to the farmers when to start feeding, to start drying grain, when to add fertilizers to the crops and so on. And so the project depends very much on the background of the students and what is available uh, at that any point in time in conference. In entrepreneurship, the key characteristic of the program is the nurture. It's an 18 months program that leads you from how do you come up with an idea that has a chance to succeed in the market through various steps of market research, of product research, prototyping, preparing business and marketing plans, going to ask for funding, and eventually moving it to a start phase. Not all the students end up in that, about half of them do, about half don't. It depends very much on individual students. Uh, it is not competition with MBA because MBA trains you to be a person working for a large company. This trains you how to start your own company. Last year, one of the teams in the entrepreneurship program was a winner of the Global Startup Battle in the area and had people from many teams from many different countries, uh, so called group numbers. Finally, public policy, the idea is to equip you with capabilities to be able to frame public policy issues, to identify solutions to public policy issues, and hopefully work with decision makers, i.e. politicians, to help them understand what are the ramifications of various decisions that they make. Besides, something good on TV to say, no more qualified funds in there. What does that mean in real life? The program provides an broad understanding and the background required for these kind of things. And which you all alumni from this program are very challenging interesting jobs in the public sector or the NGOs, okay? So if you want to contact us, our website is mset.mcmaster.ca. Uh, mset is McMaster School of Engineering Practice. Our uh, email is uh, mset.mcmaster.ca, same thing. We are on the fifth floor in ETB building, but last year we have building or you just drop by and talk. Any questions? Uh, for people who are already in Canada, June 1 is still okay. For people who are needing to get visa, May 1. In the summer, the graduate school gets the blog. We also have people applying at the last moment. So if you apply by June 1, let's say we complete everything at the school within three weeks, we send it to graduate school. Last year was taking four to six weeks to graduate school to ship their approvals. So some people were getting offers to come to graduate school after September 1st. That's basically it. Anybody else? Okay, so if not, uh, you can always drop by or somewhere in my 4 w four class, you can always ask questions. See if they can.
the report is a maximum of seven pages plus one other page. Your name may not appear anywhere else on pages two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, because the cover page is going to be stripped off and three other people in the class will grade your work anonymously. So for that peer evaluation to work successfully, your name only appears on the first page to, to keep that confidentiality. It's no different to say peer evaluation if you submitted a journal publication or one day in your career you might attend conferences and present conference material for your company. It's exactly the same process that gets you three people evaluate your work to decide whether you uh, whether it's successful or not. So we'll follow the same process. Um, in this course, so now the grading from the peer evaluation counts for some value, but the vast majority of the grading is from myself um, on the project. But the peer evaluation is just a way for you to get a feel for what it feels like to read other people's projects and other work. The methodology of grading is very clearly laid out in the website. There's a complete rubric for it's about that it tells people when you're grading what they're looking for. In fact, you will grade your own project before you submit it and your grade that you give yourself will count towards your grade. Just to give you a one small practice run at what grading is by following you. Okay, so take a look at that. Projects are due on Monday electronically only. We will not accept any copies um, in order to manage the peer review process. Okay, so the vast majority of are very comfortable with submitting electronic documents in this course. So that should be any questions on that? So 
So we derived those four coefficients last time. Let's just take a look at one important point I omitted to talk about, and that is the center point over there. The center point had a value here of $470. So that was my profit at the center point. What is the predicted profit at the center point of the least squares model? Right. 
those are the two equations we'll use. The first equation gives us absolute values. The second equation gives us differences. So if we look back at this equation here, delta xt equals 1, we could write that as delta t actual, we said last time was 5 Kelvin. And similarly, delta xs then gets mapped to a change in s. S actual, which is how much in this case with capital delta S. Before we even go run the experiment, 
what's your prediction of profit? You've got two minutes. Back to answering this question, what is y hat 5? Well, we need these 
these coded units, let's use them then. The coded units tell us that the prediction at experiment number five, we plug into our least squares well, that's 390 plus 55 times xt. Well, xt at this point is 1 plus 139 times xs. So xs in coded units, if you do the calculation, is 2.49. Sorry, 2.44. So 2.44. Minus 3.5 times xt xs. What's always helpful is to understand what the contributions are from each of the terms. So this first term one is obviously the intercept, so that's 390. The xt is the first term. That's going to buy you an additional $55 of profit. So your baseline profit is $390. The xt boosts your profit by $55. The xs term boosts your profit by $327. Okay. And the two-factor interaction actually decreases your profit by $8.5. So your total predicted Y5 is equal to $764. So without even doing the experiment, we're predicting that my profit at point number 5 is going to be $764. Y hat of zero was 390. 
So it gives us that $17 difference. That $17 gives you a feel for the order of magnitude of the error you expect. So if you expect errors of about $20, Here's an error of $100, that's a pretty big error. Here's another way you can tell what that error is, whether it's substantial or not. Take a look at the slope coefficient for ST, 55. That slope coefficient tells you that if you change the temperature by one coded unit, you'll get a $55 increase. So to have an error that's about $100 is to be off by about two coded units. Two coded units is pretty substantial, right? If you go back to the original context of this drawing, that difference from the lower bound to the upper bound, that's two coded units, going from minus one to plus one. You're pretty far off if you're off by about that amount, okay? Telling you your model is starting to break down. In fact, with that knowledge, I would rebuild my model almost at that point. Okay? But what I've kind of done is I've said, well, you know what, let me just go a little bit further and see. Okay, so let's go to point six. Now, before I head off to point six, I want to show you how you can do what you've just done here manually in R. So you're going to need to do this for your next assignment. In R, you can, you can do the following. As, as I said, is close to the line. You can go take that temperature substrate, and there's the five data points minus one, plus one, minus one, plus one, and the zero, zero, and the corresponding y values. You can go build a model with that, and if you take the summary of that, you get exactly the least squares model we've been discussing. Uh, intercept 390, salt coefficient 55, 134, and minus uh, 3 and a half. And you see that there's one degree of freedom, which is exactly what we expect. Now, we, we like to visualize this model. So there's code here in R that I'll show you. On the website, I've also posted code for that, for those of you that like to use that. But either way, what I'm going to do here next is I'm going to show you how you can visualize that surface in coded units. So the first thing you need to do is tell the software how carefully you want to visualize the surface. So I'm using a resolution of 50. Bump it down to higher value to smooth the little plots. Um, I also want to visualize this within a bound from minus 5 to plus 5. So my baseline is 0, 0. I want to see what the surface looks like between minus 5 and plus 5. So I'm going to create a grid over that area. That's what this code does. There's nothing there to see. And then I'm going to go run that grid through the model. I'm going to basically predict every point on the grid that v squared is one. And when we do that, we can just use this code uh, over there. And that's going to plot that surface over there. So let's take a look at that and we'll zoom it in. Now, what I want you to notice here is that this plot now uses coded units. There's your zero, zero point. These points correspond to the minus one, plus one combinations. Whereas the plot that you've got in the notes in front of you, that if you look at the x and y axes, those are in real world units. This is probably a better representation of what's going on in the coded units. And you can see why we're heading up in that direction. That's the direction of greatest descent. Notice also that those lines are a little bit bent. They're not parallel to each other. And the reason is because this is the Model with that two-factor interaction included. So you see a little bit of curvature, and the stronger this curvature, the, the greater that two-factor interaction is. So if you see very curved lines here, that's indicative of a strong two-factor interaction. Now we can plot where that fifth data point is, that fifth experiment. There's some code over here. Show me the data point corresponding to experiment five. I'll put a little bit of explanatory text up there. Let's just do that again for you now. And then you can see encoded units where experiment 5 is. Experiment 5 is at plus 1 on the temperature axis, and it's at a value just over there for the S axis. So if we're going from this point, the 0, 
go to there for experiment five, we're going to head over there if we want to do experiment six. So notice what this is predicting. This says if I keep marching up along this curve, I expect a value that's sort of in the order of a thousand dollars of profit if I keep marching up along that direction. Let's do that calculation as one final time for you to practice stepping along the surface.
it says 390 for my intercept plus 55 for the slope coefficient times 2 for xt plus 139 or 134, I forget which it is, for the slope coefficient for, for s times 4.88. Plus, we can have a two-factor interaction over there as well. Let's, let's take that into account. Of minus 3.5 times 2 times 4.88. And again, it's useful to see the relative contribution from T, from S, and from the two-factor interaction. So that's 390. We'll get $110 boost, a predictive boost from temperature. From substrate, we get a pretty large boost of $654 predicted. And then the two-factor interaction actually works against us, but it drops the profit by $34. So the predicted Y hat 6 is, in fact, $1,120. which matches pretty closely to what we see up there. Now the sad thing is, unfortunately, when we go run the sixth experiment, Y6, the actual dollars that you, you record as profit there is 688. So what can we now say about our model? It's totally wrong. This model is probably not even useful anymore. Okay. We've, we've really exceeded the bounds of where this model is applicable. Notice we built the model in this local region that corresponds to a temperature range and a substrate range that works in that zone. But beyond the bounds, it's, it's starting to break down. So if we go check what those bounds were, as long as our temperature was sort of in this region of 300 and our substrate is in that zone, that model works very well for us. We start to deviate far away from the model. This slope beneath our feet doesn't follow that same linear pattern. And this difference between the prediction and actual is our key way of telling us that, hang on a sec, we've got something wrong. Okay. Now, when I first taught this course, I told my students, you should just keep walking until you see your profit increase, increase, and it has in fact increased from five to six. It went from 660, I think, to 608, so it increased, but it actually starts to drop when you get to point seven. That's not really good advice. Better advice is to increase until you start to notice your model doesn't work anymore. You don't wait, you don't have to wait to do experiments to see it drop off. You can actually start at point six. Okay. And then what we're going to look at in tomorrow's class, we're going to rebuild our model at point six. And that's going to become our new zero zero point. Right there at the center is our new zero zero point. And we could rebuild at five, but I'll consider that in tomorrow's class. Okay. So that's where we're going to leave off for today. And all of those thoughts, we're going to pull this example together and finish it up in tomorrow's class.